And this has been truly enriching. I think it's it's the treasure trove of information that not many people have access to. So, I mean, I were to specialize in, let's say, Mandarin then or Arabic. So those languages might take a little more time than French or German. So how does uh, it work for them? Two KC toppers per se, you know, top one, two, three, four, fifth rank toppers. Why aren't they opting for the foreign services and why are they preferring the IAS or the IPS? The Indian Foreign Service is the diplomatic service and essential civil services of the government of India under the Ministry of External Affairs. The Foreign Secretary of India is the head of the services. Post-retirement, Indian Foreign Service officers have held high offices including that of the President of India, K.R. Narayanan, Vice President of India, Muhammad Hamid Ansari, Speaker of Lok Sabha, Meera Kumari, and various cabinet ministers such as Hardeep Singh Puri, and also the incumbent Minister of External Affairs, Subramaniam Jaishankar. Before 1948, some of the diplomats were appointed directly by the Prime Minister of India and included the former native rulers of India who had integrated their provinces into India. It was only from 1948 onwards, the IFS officers were recruited directly based on the civil services exam conducted by the UPSC. In the first episode of the Money Heist podcast, we talk about the career in the Indian Foreign Services. To all the new heisters, Money Heist podcast will cover my contrarian philosophy on money, life and career. I hope you enjoy the first episode. Hi everyone, welcome to the first episode of uh, the Money Heist. And the first guest for the podcast is a dear friend of mine, Prathit, who is a member of the India's Foreign Services and worked across uh, the Caribbean, Germany, and is currently based in DC. So thank you so much, Prathit, for taking all the time. No, no, thank you. Thank you, Naman, for inviting me. And I'm uh, very happy that you are uh, starting, kickstarting the series uh, Money Heist. And I'm even more grateful and even more happy that uh, you've invited me as uh, the first guest this series so i'm very uh, much looking forward to interacting with you and your uh, audience and uh, sharing my experiences and looking forward to a fruitful discussion wonderful so uh, so a few days ago prathit i wrote uh, a newsletter and approximately 20000 subscribers folks have subscribed to the newsletter and call it money heist i have no no reason why i call it money heist but uh, i just went with the flow and okay. uh, the idea is simple the, the day and age that we live in, youngsters want to become rich very early. They want to invest in stocks. They want to uh, invest in public markets or in, in, in private markets and gain exponential returns. But uh, the idea of money heist is a little different. So it's uh, the, the best way to, to wealth generation is about investing in skill sets, investing in experiences and investing in relationships. And one profession that has always excited me is the profession of the foreign services, where you truly live the experiences across cultures, across uh, geographies. You forge wonderful relationships, not just with the nation states, but also with uh, the wonderful people in, in various regions across, across the states. And you also end up developing multiple skill sets in the journey. And therefore, I thought it's a no-brainer to have you in the podcast. And I'm so delighted that you agreed. And uh, I look forward to an enriching conversation without the wine that I had requested, but you chose to not bring in. So tell me a, tell me a journey. Who is Pratit? And uh, what's, what's your story so far? Okay, uh, so uh, to begin, uh, I would say Pratit or is small uh, town boy like most of us back in india uh, i am from a city called Allahabad, now called uh, prayagraj and i have uh, been born there brought up there i have studied in a convent school there but the city is not like a metro city and it's not like a small town so it's a town of uh, it's a city of around uh, 1.5 million uh, population very well connected but it has that rural feel also because as you go out of the city you have like the rural India, while as I said, it is also very connect, very connected to the urban centers of the country. So I got an exposure uh, to both sides of India, as we call it, the <clears throat> urban India and the rural India. So I grew, grew up in that environment, but I did not travel a lot. I stayed in Uttar Pradesh. I stayed in my city for most of my time. That uh, so, and I think that molded me uh, a lot because I find that my experience uh, during uh, my first 18 years or 20 years in Allahabad 
mm-hmm. has like prepared me to interact with a wide a wide array of people whether it be in cities or in villages or from different stripes e- even when i'm uh, living outside india so i think that experience uh, enriches me and helps me in that regard also uh, cut to the, the chase i did my schooling in allahabad then i uh, intro, uh, then i basically joined uh, btech because i just went with the flow like other colleagues or students or friends and then i dropped out of engineering after 6 months so i joined nit bhopal civil engineering and then i joined a ba at university of allahabad and did my uh, law degree at university of allahabad but it was during my uh, time at the university of allahabad that i came in contact with political science political science was one of my subjects and the mea which is the ministry of external affairs it runs a series called distinguished lecture series in which in which retired indian diplomats go to these different universities the political science departments and the ir departments and take lectures on foreign policy and india's uh, relationship with the world and interacting uh, with, yeah and in, uh, that is where uh, like i got inspired and i thought that uh, if i'm going into government service mm-hmm. it has to be a foreign service so i like a lot of people who fill like the upsc form yeah. thinking to go into any service preferably the administ- administrative service or the police service where you wield a lot of power my yeah. motivation to fill that upsc form uh, from day one was to enter the indian foreign service and i was lucky that i could do so in a couple of years after that uh, you go along with everybody uh, to labasna which is in masuri where you get trained together after that you get trained for a while in delhi and then i was posted to uh, berlin uh, for a year and a half where i had to learn the german language while also work at the embassy of india in berlin learning the tricks of the trade and you they transfer you to different uh, divisions or different desks so that you get like an overall view of how an embassy functions after that i was posted for two years and a half uh, at the high commission of india in jamaica where uh, we have a small mission there and uh, i was the head of chancery there i also did political work so this has been my journey after uh, that time i thought that i was maybe getting a little off beat and yeah. i had always thought that i should get a professional degree in foreign service at some point in my life and i was thinking uh, that the earlier the better and the more like time elapses it would be difficult to go back into academics so i took my study leave Mm-hmm. and i joined the george town university uh, for uh, pursuing uh, this masters in international relations so this is like oh, that's amazing Ag- against all the advice and against all the nudges prathet decided to not join fletcher or harvard he chose uh, george town one of our competitors but prathet your story is extremely fascinating you know you grew up in in uttar pradesh you studied in madhya pradesh and this is the region of india that is uh, spellbound by the power and perks and privileges of an ias officer or ips officer so why didn't you choose the ias or the ips and what excited or motivated you to join the foreign services okay so let's just say that the pull of foreign service uh, was more uh, than all the other factors of uh, being in the hindi heartland and being mm-hmm. like getting all those voices that you need to uh, if you uh, get a chance to go into the government service you must go to the uh, administrative or the police service so uh, so for me i had never uh, thought about going into government service had that been my first motivation maybe i would have thought of administrative or the police uh, service as my first option mm-hmm. when i thought my first uh, like love was with uh, the international relations or uh, with foreign policy mm-hmm. and that is when i started exploring how to uh, make a career out of it and that is how i came in like got to know about uh, the indian foreign service and then the upsc because i got to know that if you got to get into foreign service you have to go to upsc and that that's how i started preparing for most of the people it is the other way around mm-hmm. they need a job a government job mm-hmm. and they need they need to get into is and ips and then they get into upsc for me it was foreign policy indian foreign service and mm-hmm. therefore upsc so it was uh, if you can say <laughs> the other way around mm-hmm. and uh, so uh, and the charm of uh, the indian foreign service as i said uh, those uh, lectures by retired uh, ambassadors and diplomats mm-hmm. at the university of allahabad that just sucked me in <laughs> any any specific <laughs> lecture lecture that you remember and uh, others could benefit from it so there was one lecture by uh, Bhash- ambassador bhashwati mukherji who mm-hmm. was uh, india's uh, re- like retired indians india's ambassador to the netherlands 
and she came to the university to the political science department and she talked about india's uh, like foreign policy approach towards europe Mm-hmm. because she was a europe uh, specialist and i got to interact with her even after the lecture uh, because uh, i was also a part of the administrative uh, like i was helping in the logistical part also yeah. so i uh, spent time with her for two days i got a lot of time uh, with her i spoke to her and uh, that sort of influenced me because she told me about how the mea functions how we have different divisions how you can specialize in a division how you work in an embassy what's the life of a diplomat Mm-hmm. and so there was no looking back after that another incident was uh, afghani ambassador to india he mm-hmm. visited uh, okay so and uh, the, and the university of allahabad so uh, as i told you uh, i had uh, remained in allahabad uh, for most of my time so unlike like people uh, or students studying in delhi university or maybe in the jnu where they on and off have shoulders uh, with uh, diplomats because they keep coming to the universities or to think tanks or to open public events where uh, they can see them in person interact with them for me as an enthusiast uh, enthusiast in uh, foreign policy international relations to see an actual ambassador of a different com- country coming to the university was a big thing mm-hmm. these are like two specific instances but uh, obviously uh, because this distinguished lecture series was something in which a retired diplomat came almost every month or every two months mm-hmm. so it was like a continuous process of influence and and uh, that is why i chose to join the foreign service wow that's amazing so i have this genuine question from you that uh, there was an era you know in 80s and 90s and even i think the early phases of 2000 that uh, the ifs was the preferred choice of services amongst all the upsc toppers there's a very yeah. famous story of uh, i think kapil sibbal who mm-hmm. whose brother elder brother tamil sibbal was also in the ifs he mm-hmm. uh, retired as the foreign secretary of india and when kapil sibbal appeared for upsc uh, his first choice was for the foreign services but unfortunately he got into the ias and later on chose to not not pursue it the same is the case with one of my dear friends sumit said i'm not sure if you know him sumit uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, was obviously he was a deputy uh, wow well, so even sumit when he appeared for upsc ifs was the only choice and okay. um, and he ended up clearing and becoming an ifs officer a wonderful ifs officer for for india but uh, this trend has changed in the past few years what could be the reason why are the upsc toppers per se you know top 1 2 3 4 5th rank toppers mm-hmm. why aren't they opting for the foreign services and why are they preferring the ias or the ips over the foreign services what could be the reason okay so a couple of points obviously uh, i have like heard the same stories that during the 70s and obviously so to, uh, these these are not just stories the 70s 80s 90s were the times uh, when foreign service used to just fill up in the first 20 or 30 uh, like the people who were selected yeah. selected the first had the first 20 30 ranks just filled up the foreign service and then seats for the administrative ser- services started filling up but i think uh, the change in trend has a lot to do uh, with india's liberalization after 1990s 91 uh, because before that there was also a feeling that if you wanted a good life it could only be had abroad or let's just say uh, that the life abroad the quality of life abroad is incomparable to life uh, anything that you could do in india however after liberalization uh, with the economy growing with the standard of life getting better even though the people uh, in is and ips did lead a uh, good quality of life even before the 1990s but the whole picture of india as a place to stay yeah. became more attractive so i think this is one reason why uh, a lot of people uh, choose now to stay uh, back in india rather than just thinking that you could have a very uh, good quality of life for yourself and your family abroad and the reason would be that the the base from which the civil servants come that ha- that has become much more broad broad based in the last 20 30 years than it was before so when a person from uh, uttar pradesh or maybe an entire region from bihar fills up the form uh, his urge is somewhere to maybe come back to bihar or to up and work for his or her people while uh, foreign service uh, can seem like a distant leap of faith yeah. and maybe he or she uh, cannot connect how working there would directly benefit uh, uh, his village or his district or his state so this could be one of the reasons but another practical reason is that you, uh, before the 1990s the number of seats that we had in foreign service was like 9 10 sometimes 7 or 5 mm-hmm. however the number of seats now my batch was 30 90 and uh, the batches are between 25 to Which 40 is still uh, minuscule 
which is still minuscule but uh, comparatively mm -hmm. uh, like three or four times than the batches that we had in before 1990s so or even in 2000s i think the batches were uh, sometimes 9 or 11 mm -hmm. so when you have more seats to fill up obviously uh, the ranks still which they would be filled would go uh, maybe after 100 or some things like that however for example i can give you an example from my batch the second ranker took foreign service the ninth ranker took foreign service 11 13th 15th 23rd 26th so it's not that people are not taking uh, foreign service people who specifically want to go into the foreign service and i think it's good people who uh, actually have like a motivation to go into foreign service whether they are at the top or maybe uh, in the middle ranks are still going into foreign service so i think it's a good differentiation but th there are all sorts of reasons i i yeah. really like your point about the the exposure effect sort of a thing that uh, everyone in the rural towns and in the tier 2 tier 3 cities they know what a collector does or what an sp does but they have no idea what is the job of a uh, head of chancery or the second secretary or the first secretary and that could perhaps be the reason because uh, they have no exposure to it so if you were to talk about your time in the foreign services let's start with the cfl uh, what is cfl and uh, which one did you choose and why and how is this allocation happens and and okay. later on we'll talk more about your time in jamaica and uh, your your journey in the sec as as a second secretary okay after you get uh, selected into foreign service as i told you uh, earlier you get three and a half years of training in masuri at abasna which is the lahal bahadur uh, uh, center for administrative service after that you come to delhi we have uh, the shushma swaraj indian foreign service institute uh, which is uh, very near to jnu it, the campus is called the old jnu campus where you get trained for about 6 uh, to 7 months uh, you have all sorts of lectures from people in the ministry of external affairs retired ambassadors diplomats even ambassadors from different countries can uh, come and talk, speak to you people from the academic field jnu is very close and after that you get attached to the ministry for a couple of months sometimes uh, more than 3 or 4 months uh, where you uh, get assigned to a specific division uh, division so for example i worked in the uh, western europe uh, division for 2 months so you get an exposure of how the ministry works after that you get posted to a country uh, where you have to learn one language one foreign language and you have to pass an examination uh before being confirmed in the foreign service so the way it goes is uh, there is a list of uh, languages and the number of seats allocated to each language that uh, comes out once you uh, while you are in delhi while you are in training and then you have to give your first preference second preference third preference like you do do in uh, upsc with, with the services and yeah. depending on your standing in uh, the service you get allocated a language so i chose german and i went to germany and what happens uh, once you join the embassy there you are uh, completely part of the embassy you are called a third secretary which mm -hmm. is equivalent of uh, a, a second secretary but uh, it just denotes that uh, you are still not confirmed in the service got it so, you have, so what would be the equivalent so, of uh, a third secretary in the ias and the ips it would be under secretary uh, it it would be under secretary under uh, secretary so third secretary second secretary would be an under secretary in delhi okay got it what happens once you are there what happens is that you get enrolled in a language institute so for example uh, the institute for german language is the goethe institute in berlin so me and my colleague neeraj uh, we were both uh, posted in berlin we used mm -hmm. to uh, go in the morning to the goethe institute learn german for 3 hours and return before lunch to the embassy after lunch we worked at the embassy for uh, till the evening so this is how our like schedules were and after uh, one one and a half years uh, you take the examination you pass it and then you you are confirmed in the service so after that you uh, like work full time at them so you are like a full time foreign Got service it. officer so i mean i were to specialize in let's say mandarin then or arabic so those languages might take a little more time than french or german so how does uh, it work for them in terms of promotion aspects and so on and so forth so i uh, there are uh, different languages uh, that take different time arabic i think uh, so mandarin and korean i think these are the three languages trainees are given i think uh, two years to pass uh, the language as opposed to french spanish german which we have to pass in less than uh, one one year and a half less than 18 months but the promotion uh, aspects are the same so okay once they are confirmed and uh, if even if you have been confirmed uh, so the whole batch is confirmed at the same time even if you have passed like before once they pass everybody gets confirmed in the service at the same time so everybody starts off at the same level there is no issue of seniority or juniority is anyone who has failed the, failed the exam sorry is there anyone who yeah, has failed the exam 
so uh, people uh, so it's a very difficult exam and it is not uh, it is taken by a government in delhi so the paper goes and uh, we take the exam the people do uh, fail the exam and what happens is uh, they take it again and they pass it then but without passing uh, the language exam uh, you cannot be confirmed into service got it uh, this is very helpful and um, in terms of your experiences as uh, the second secretary Uh, how does a regular day look like what are your daily responsibilities how stressful it is how stressful is it for your family if you are in a country that's not very very safe for india so how does how's it how's it does a day look like for you as a second secretary so uh, as a second secretary i would say uh, that uh, there are different responsibilities given to different officers and it varies across the world so if you are uh, for example a second secretary at the embassy of india in berlin your work and your day uh, in berlin would look very different uh, to a second secretary who's posted at the high commission of india in jamaica or for that matter if a person is for example posted in syria or iraq his or her day would be or work responsibilities would be completely different so what happens uh, at a small uh, embassy or a small mission uh, like uh, we have at the high commission uh, in jamaica in kingston is that uh, there is less of work specialization and you have to do a lot of things together so because uh, we are a small mission there the officer uh, is interested for example with the chancery responsibilities which is running day to day administration of the high commission while also doing political work that is reporting on political affairs in that country back to delhi sending political reports or make, taking up political issues uh, with the government uh, with the foreign ministry mm-hmm. in the host country while and he or she may also be made to do commercial work and publicity work and consular work because the embassy is or the high commission is small whereas if you are maybe at the embassy of india in washington dc there would be because also the volume of the work volume of work is more there could be two or three or four or five officers only in the political department or in the com- and in the commercial department and in the consular department so when you get into a small mission you practically do everything every day and there is no uh, there is nothing that you can say no to because there is no second person uh, to do that but it, it also gives you exposure to a lot of things that you would not have had if you were in a uh, larger mission so i think uh, work wise i think uh, whether you are like in any mission of around the world in an indian mission you would have a lot of work you would be busy all day mm-hmm. the nature of the work uh, yeah. would be different also in larger missions what happens is that you get switched from uh, one uh, division to another so you could be working in the political division maybe for an year and the next year uh, the ambassador or the high commissioner or the consul general cg would want you to work in the commercial division so you get switched on to different divisions right. also yeah. and and what does the hierarchy look like in the mbc versus the consulate and uh... what's the difference between uh, the kind of work structure and stream that a diplomat might have in the embassy versus the consulate also a con- consulate is uh, more uh, some countries like which are uh, important or very big to uh, cover uh, just by a single mission what happens is that we have consulates uh, two in addition to the embassy so for example in berlin we had our embassy in berlin while we had our consulate in munich we had it in hamburg we have it in hamburg and we have it in uh, frankfurt the consulates mostly deal with the consular work and uh, they have geographical divisions so they cover a certain area while also pursuing commercial work and also reporting on the local political work in the area yeah so but they are all uh, the embassy in berlin is basically heading all uh, like all the consulates work uh, fall under the embassy embassy is our like main mission there which has the responsibility for the whole country but the work is divided among two or three different missions because the area of responsibility and the volume of work is more got it um makes a lot of sense and uh, another thing that uh, is concerning for many aspirants who are aiming for foreign services about uh, the life of a spouse in the foreign services my sense is that you're married at least uh, based on on your whatsapp picture so a few days ago i met the met the uh, indian ambassador here in serbia sanjeev kohli and uh, he told me that his wife was a practicing doctor and uh, because of the diplomatic journey that he had across you know the saudi arabia and iraq so on and so forth she decided to sacrifice on her on her medical career or medical mm-hmm. journey 
um, I'm, I'm sure, you know, uh, now things must have changed. The the kind of careers a spouse can pursue has also changed. Uh, so what are the technical challenges or practical challenges that a, that a spouse might face? And how easy or difficult is it to assuage those concerns for anyone who's a, a, a aspiring for a career in foreign services? I would say that spouses or foreign service officers have to sacrifice a lot because foreign service officers keep moving all around the world. Uh, throughout the length of their careers, so they would. Uh, so if you take any uh, ten year slot, if you if the uh, foreign service officer has had two foreign postings and has lived in Delhi, he would practically have lived in three different regions across the world. The nature of postings differ. For uh, just take my example, I was in India, I was in Berlin, where uh, if for example the spouse is in the IT sector, uh, mm-hmm. he or she could uh, easily find work, and then I was in. Kingston, where there were not a lot of companies and the crime situation, and so finding work was difficult. To go with this is another uh, technical aspect because you have uh, sort of bilateral agreements with countries, and the spouse is not allowed to work in every country that you are posted. Oh. So that has improved a lot in the last some years because the Indian government has sort of pushed on this aspect, and now the spouses are allowed to work in a lot of countries. But that is also an issue that has to be considered. Considered. So what happens is the spouses, as I said, have to sacrifice a lot, a lot of time. They have to curtail their careers to be with the foreign service officer. And uh, so, yeah, this is something that has to be accounted for uh, before joining the service. However, having said that, I would say that uh, if uh, because of uh, the COVID pandemic, there has been an acceleration uh, in the work from home yeah. and using Zoom and digital tools to work. And that has sort of helped a lot. So I can give you an example of my wife. My uh, wife was working uh, from Jamaica online uh, for an Indian company. And she's still working while she's in Washington, D.C. because uh, she sort of has this online tool and the company allows that. So that has simplified matters a lot because had this not been the case, she would not have worked whether in Kingston or uh, in Washington, D.C. And then we would have to sort of think whether she should go back to India to pursue her career because a gap in the career is, uh, in, in the IT sector is also not good or she should just leave the job and stay with me. So this has helped a lot, but this is something that has to be factored in before joining the service uh, because spouses do have to sacrifice a lot. But I mean, on a good, on the brightest side, I think things are improving. And uh, the way yeah. things were in the 40s and 50s and, and the 90s, that's not the case anymore. And with the emergence of work from home and uh, various other ways you can, you can, you can launch your own startups or uh, work in startups uh, yeah. from whom another, another, yeah. Yeah. another thing I would like to add is this, uh, the foreign service officer has an ecosystem uh, in which uh, he, he or she sort of goes and naturally embeds into because there is this whole ecosystem of the embassy or the high commission mm-hmm. with all the other officers and the MEA officials and the local staff and everybody and so and uh, he or she spends 6 or 7 or 8 hours every day there and so getting transplanted from a country and going to B country is not that painful because there is a al- already a ready-made social circle there. Mm-hmm. However, it is more difficult for spouses because once they go into a new place, at least for the first three, four, five months, there are no relationships, there are no friends, and uh, he or like the spouse has to sort of work from scratch and build those relationships. So that is also something that get, that becomes very difficult for uh, spouses. The initial three, four, or uh, six months, not even not only for the spouses, but even the children, to get acclimatized, to get adjusted uh, to a new country for the first six months, or maybe for the first year, and then after getting adjusted, to just mm-hmm. move back, move again uh, to a new country when all the relationships mm-hmm. have sort of found, formed and matured for three years. So and that's very painful too. I think um, there's fun in that aspect. You know, you get to be in challenging situations and these challenges allow you to develop a lot of empathy while working with people from multiple geographies and the kind of globalized world that we live in. It's actually a blessing in blessing in disguise. That's that's how I look at, look at it. Talking about spouse, I think uh, someone told me that the, the most fun, if the father is in foreign services, your kid will have a lot of fun. Uh, the you get to travel the world, you get to study in top-notch schools. So how? So what is a diplobrat? A term I I think I stumbled upon this term a few days ago called diplobrat. What is diplobrat, and uh, how how is the life of a kid 
or or kids in in the foreign services okay no man so i can just tell you from uh, second hand experience uh, but uh, like from whatever i have seen uh, the diplo uh, brats as you call them the kids of uh, diplomats uh, not even diplomats of all the me me officials for that matter because in this sense uh, our ministry is very liberal it accords the same facilities to the son or daughter or the children of any me me official who is serving abroad as is given uh, to an indian foreign service officer so get, they get to study in the best schools uh, in the country or in the city where they are posted and uh, it's all on the government obviously and uh, they get a lot of exposure because they get to interact with a lot of international kids they get to know the most exciting careers that are coming up much more uh, not much before than maybe their friends back in other places they get to meet people like the top notch people of that country along with their parents so all that exposure is very helpful these people have gone on to make very successful uh, careers later so yeah. i think they have uh, a lot of exposure a very comfortable life initially but as i said uh, this issue of just remaining in a country for 3 years and just sort of moving from place to place and changing schools and changing friends along the way is a sort of something that uh, they have to develop skills to get used to too yeah so if you were to have kids they will hate you for initial years but in the long run they will love you because of the kind of exposure that uh, they they will be getting in uh, because of uh, your job um another question that i stumble upon and many people have asked me as well is the difference between ifs a versus ifs b what is that and uh, i th- i don't think much has been spoken about it anywhere else how are how are ifs b recruited and how is it different from the ifs a oh so uh, i am afraid i would not have like a lot of uh, like uh, like specific knowledge on uh, this thing but uh, ifs a is basically uh, the indian foreign service members for which are uh, recruited from uh, this combined upsc examination uh, which uh, selects the indian administrative service indian police service revenue service all these officers so yeah. that is what is ifsa i i am guessing ifsb uh, is another uh, service uh, or cadre uh, in the mea as are different cadres of uh, people who uh, do the typing and so on and Sorry. so forth we have different others in the mea as far as i know i think ifs b are uh, selected through uh, this ssc which is a combined all india right. examination and they also uh, uh, serve uh, in delhi they also make the rank and file in delhi as well as, as well as in uh, uh, our missions and posts abroad and as i said uh, according to your experience according to your uh, place in the hierarchy according to your specialization and according to your performance you like keep getting uh, you you are like you are given different responsibilities different tasks so that's how it goes got it and do these ifas be also be holding uh, the top tier diplomatic positions in years to come if they were to perform diligently well so i i'm not sure if i'm completely correct but uh, if you go to a state there there are pcs officers and there are is officers mm-hmm. and then there are, there is this promotion uh, periodic promotion according to your uh, like time in the service as well as your performance and then you get like get promoted and uh, become senior in the service or occupy uh, more important positions so that's how i think it works for ifsa and ifs b2 so if you are good enough if you have performed well enough why not you can go even like uh, and occupy important positions in the service important and what are the parameters on which the performance is uh, gauged and are, are there certain outcomes outputs based on which uh, the mea will promote you or is it just uh, the tenure and time based promotion in the foreign services so, so as in uh, all the government services in india it is time based and uh, there is a certain uh, like path to your career uh, and if you are in the service long enough obviously you will be promoted in a certain way but as is measured in different uh, government services your uh, performance is evaluated by your immediate senior and then seconded by uh, the second senior and so the same uh, method is applied in our service also you have this review yearly review mm-hmm. that happens in all government services that we also go through apart from that 
as in any government or any private service your work speaks for you so if you are, and we are a small service so if you are working well obviously people will get to know about that and that's how basically you will uh, be given an important portfolio or something that you like or something that you have specialization in so that also works the word of the mouth obviously also works as in any government or private service and there is this formal evaluation process yearly annual evaluation mm-hmm. process like in other government service too so both a combination of both got it so i think so many of the people who clear the ias exam their dream is to become a collector uh, mm-hmm. but for a diplomat it is to become an ambassador so how much time does it usually take to become an ambassador and uh, and i am assuming that this there's, there's going to be a ranking of a country based on which uh, you will be given the ambassador status so for example if a small state might uh, it would be much easier but uh, i don't have much clarity so uh, off to you and and explain what what how much how how long does it take to become an ambassador so uh, we have countries uh, the p5 for example the us china uh, france uk all these countries uh, where obviously the most senior and the best performing uh, would uh, become ambassadors for example our ambassador uh, in the us is a secretary level officer and then there are countries where young officers also get posted as ambassadors or uh, high commissioners or uh, even uh, consul generals uh, very early in the career but i am guessing to become an ambassador or a high commissioner even uh, for a country that uh, is like not a very with which india let's say has uh, does not have uh, very important or strategic relations i think for, uh, if, uh, until you have served for a decade and a half in the service i don't think you would be made an ambassador or a high commissioner unlike in the indian administrative service where you become a collector or a dm as we call it in 7 years sometimes 8 or 9 or 10 years i think you will have to because it's a very serious job you are basically mm-hmm. uh, you are repre- uh, you are representing your country in that country anything you say carries yes. a lot of weight you are interacting with the heads of states the head of government the foreign minister or different ministers or secretaries in that country and you are your top officer in that country so at least a decade and a half but uh, that is not a given that okay. is not a given obviously your performance obviously and for the most important countries obviously the best and the most senior to get those posts makes sense so uh, and and is there any reason why it is called as ambassador and plenipotentiary why is that term plenipotentiary used and what does it mean oh, <laughs> no no i'll have to check that up I, okay um uh, fantastic uh, so based on your your journey in the foreign services so far how long have you been part of the foreign services so i joined the foreign service i am uh, of the t- uh, 2017 batch so yeah. uh, my training started in uh, august to september uh, in labasna in december uh, 17 we came uh, to delhi 18 i went to uh, germany berlin and 20 i joined in jamaica so i have uh, completed 5 years into the service now mm-hmm. and now i am on 2 uh, years study break or study leave yeah and so when i go back into the service after 2 years in 2024 i'll be 7 years into the service phenomenal and uh, so what is the eligibility to take the study break and uh, does mea promote study breaks or and and do they even finance these study breaks so what's the entire methodology like there so uh, as regards financing uh, so if you are on a study leave obviously the government helps you uh, not with the uh, like uh, giving you the fees for uh, the university as such but obviously they help you uh, with your salary and stuff like that in india because you are a government officer at mm-hmm. uh, at that time the government has uh, or the foreign ministry has taken a view that uh, it is good to send uh, foreign service officers to specialize in certain fields to get academic exposure and to read more to interact with other uh, foreign service officers who are on study leave or study break and i see this trend this is like not a uh, written thing but obviously i am seeing this trend because a couple of years ago uh, somebody from the service went to harvard and uh, he has completed his course and has returned back to service they have given uh, me the chance uh, to study at georgetown university mm-hmm. so the government is sort of promoting that it does not pay your fees but there are certain uh, i am told that there are certain universities with which 
the foreign ministry or the external affairs ministry has a pact or an agreement and if you go to those universities after doing a certain time in the service so i think it is uh, more than 7 years or 9 years i don't know i'm not completely sure then it would be completely paid so it's like an agreement between two countries apart from that when uh, if you are posted outside or you are in delhi the government sends you for or the ministry of external affairs sends you for small training uh, uh, courses mm-hmm. abroad so it could send you to a european union uh, training course where you gain exposure to the european uh, foreign policy their history how they think interact with diplomats uh, top diplomats uh, in the european system so it could be a one month or a three month or a 15 day uh, training course when i was in berlin i was sent uh, to a training course uh, by the german foreign ministry mm-hmm. in which diplomats from different com- countries join so the government tries to like give you as much exposure as possible tries to send you to different study breaks and uh, training courses but uh, it's also upon you to finalize and choose and uh, see where you want to go or what you want to do but the government is very promote uh, very uh, helping at this point in time wow this is uh, truly remarkable and incredible now since you've been part of the diplomacy and now you're also a graduate student do diplomats party a lot harder than the graduate students so what's the i mean i think diplomats are, are infamous for throwing some lavish parties so what's what's your take on that so uh, there was a time when uh, diplomat or uh, what i heard about the uh, foreign service maybe of uh, not only for india but of different countries what was it is a service of wining and dining but i think this has completely uh, changed at least for india in the last 20 30 or 40 mm-hmm. years where we do very uh, substantial work while we are uh, abroad obviously Uh, throwing parties and uh, being part of social events is a part and parcel of the service because that is where you get to meet people interact with people make contacts use the, those contacts right, yeah. so uh, i won't say a diplomat parties hard but uh, he or she doesn't avoid parties for sure so if they get an invitation uh, you would uh, uh, surely find uh, the diplomat attending parties even if it is for a bit even if it is for like a little time but uh, obviously diplomats don't skip parties <laughs> makes sense because i think networking is an essential component of uh, the foreign services and uh, makes makes a lot of sense and in terms of the political interference so one of the reasons why people choose ifs or uh, let's say the economic service or the revenue services because uh, in the ias and the ips especially there's a lot of political interference and that can be detrimental for the family life Um, how do you see that happening in the foreign services um, is it prevalent and if yes at what stage it is prevalent and uh, yeah so uh, i am very junior to answer uh, the question of uh, political interference in foreign service but from whatever i have heard or seen negative uh, like political interference in a negative sense i don't think uh, prevails as far as uh, ministry of external affairs or foreign service is concerned obviously as part of the ministry of external affairs our mandate is to implement the for, uh, the foreign policy objectives of the government of the day so and that is dictated obviously it comes from the prime minister flowing through the external affairs minister through the foreign secretary and then to us so that is a maintain um, sorry that is a mandate and this cannot be called obviously uh, political interference this is foreign policy i would say direction makes sense apart from that i haven't come across uh, any instance uh, where my uh, ambassador or my senior would have told me or something has directly happened to me where i can attest to the fact that there is uh, political interference mm-hmm. uh, but i can uh, but there are some instances where you get to interact with for example members of parliaments or ministers as happened during covid crisis when i was in uh, posted in kingston and there were people uh, who were stranded in jamaica in uh, bahamas in turks caicos in cayman islands all these are territories accredited to the high commission of india in jamaica and once in a while you do get an email uh, from a member of parliament saying that uh, such and such person from my constituency is stuck in this and see if you can help and that is sort of a positive nudge rather than a political interference i would say but apart from that i i don't think i have come across any instance or heard about in any any instance where there has been a direct political interference in negative way wow this is wonderful and uh, prateek based on your journey you know 5 years into the services 
what are the five highlights of your life ever since you became part of uh, the foreign services five highlights that you will never forget and you might talk a lot about those highlights to your kids and all the family members so what are those five highlights that uh, you cannot forget okay so uh i would say my first highlight would be uh, my uh, visit to sri lanka because uh, once you are like while you you are getting trained you are taken uh, to an embassy or a high commission of india to just observe how the embassy or the high commission works so i was uh, fortunate to go to colombo meet the ambassador there uh, meet uh, the dcm there and the rest of the foreign service officers and the staff and go around the country and uh, see for myself the projects that uh, india is implementing in sri lanka and be uh, that was my first time in fact uh, the first time in my life that i went outside india and that was a very uh, exciting uh, thing for me and the experience that i had in colombo about how our mission works there was also very fruitful so that would always remain a highlight uh, for as long as i am in the foreign service the second would be uh, my learning of the german language so uh, apart from hindi and english i had uh, never attempted even to uh, learn mm-hmm. a third language but that was a time when i pushed myself learned this third language uh, which is german which looked very hard for me uh, at the start but i think that after this uh, one and uh, or one and a half years of uh, putting in my putting in labor i think this is an additional tool or an additional skill that i have developed and which i can most of now so that would also uh, remain a highlight uh, for, that is also highlight for me uh, and that has basically uh, come to me because i am a member of the foreign service another highlight would be during the covid crisis when a lot of people were uh, stuck uh, in uh, jamaica as well as in the accredited territories to respond to them and then eventually uh, book two private uh, flights to send them back to india uh, so we sent them back to india some of them went via london and then to uh, chennai some of them were sent through curacao which is another small dutch island territory from there to amsterdam and then to delhi to uh, make sure that all covid protocols are observed to make sure that everybody has the money uh, to buy their tickets uh, to make sure that everybody gets the visas and uh, so it was a lot of uh, work and it was very hectic especially because it it was the peak of the covid crisis but the satisfaction that everybody in the end reached their homes in india everybody uh, thanked us uh, for what uh, we did um, that is something i'll never forget uh, wow. for the length of my career so that is uh, certainly one of the highlights too for me uh, obviously the national days uh, I, i cannot like take out one national day but obviously the national days are a special thing once mm-hmm. you are in the mission uh, the vibes that you get the positive vibes uh, and the patriotic feeling that comes uh, when you are part of the national day uh, the reading of out of the speech by the ambassador that is something magical and if you are uh, like uh, ha- if you happen to be around in a city where there is an indian diplomatic post you should make it a point to go uh, to the flag hoisting ceremony uh, in the morning Yeah. either on 15th of august or 26th of january and you will not regret it so that is obviously uh, one of the highlights uh, for me uh, too and then i would say uh, getting the study leave to uh, come and uh, hone my skills to uh, study at georgetown university for two days i don't think it would be as simple as it happened uh, it became for me because of my ministry of external affairs because of the very billing administration there if i was part of any other government department because there is a lot of bureaucracy lot of inertia but i can say with confidence that the way our uh, administration works back in delhi it's very hand on and it's th- it's something uh, other departments uh, or uh, ministries can learn from oh that's wonderful and uh, at the other thing that i want to speak of is uh, the accommodation aspect of, uh, of a diplomat so how does an accommodation look like for a diplomat at least at the early stages uh, in delhi or in in later on as a third secretary and the second secretary because in comparison to the peers in the other services that should there would be a lot of difference because uh, those are capitals and obviously a mm-hmm. uh, per square foot value in the capitals is pretty pretty high so talk more about how a diplomat's uh, house look like 
Okay, so uh, as far as your accommodation abroad is concerned, the government or the ministry is very considerate to the fact that uh, our diplomat should not look second to anybody uh, in terms of housing. And the fact that if a diplomat uh, is stressed uh, psychologically about housing, about the kid's education, about how his or her family would adjust, he or she would not be able to focus on the like on his or her uh, very important work for which yeah. the person has been sent abroad. So the ministry has been very uh, considerate in this regard and uh, the accommodations that we get when we uh, are posted abroad is second to none uh, whether compare it like with any uh, foreign service like with the accommodation of any other foreign service officer uh, that happens to live abroad. So in that sense, I think uh, the Indian foreign service officers are uh, very lucky and obviously, as you go up the hierarchy, uh, your sort of ceiling increases and you can get a bigger house or a better place uh, to live. But even if you are a third secretary, you would have a very nice accommodation. Uh, and one of the reasons why uh, like good, uh, you, you sort of get to choose a good accommodation is uh, because of uh, the first, uh, the earlier point that you mentioned that you need to do a lot of social interactions you need to uh, invite people over you need to entertain them yeah. and if the accommodation is not good if the place is not good obviously that would also suffer but uh, as far as living abroad is concerned uh, for uh, diplomats or for any mea official i think the accommodations are comfortable the administration the mea is very considerate of this fact i'm not so sure when you come back to delhi mm -hmm. especially at a junior level but uh, the inputs or the feedback that I'm getting is that a lot of things are moving in Delhi also. A lot of uh, accommodations are being refurbished, either refurbished or being constructed and in a couple of year, uh, years, I think uh, the situation in Delhi would improve. Great. And uh, how do the postings take place? Uh, I mean, do they throw you anywhere in the world or do you have any preference in terms of where you want to go? So obviously you are asked about, so, uh, there is this board that sits uh, once in a while and uh, the number of uh, postings uh, all across the world that are vacant are put before you in a list and then you have to choose your preferences mm -hmm. so you have like with the language or uh, as hap as it happens in the upsc with the postings you choose your uh, postings you uh, tell uh, the administration that this is where i want to go for, for this is my first preference second preference third preference and so on but according to your utility, according to your, as I said, skill sets, your uh, history, like you, the work you have already done, the board, uh, which constitutes the most uh, senior uh, members of the foreign service, they sit and decide. And uh, there is, uh, as, as you said, you can be thrown anywhere in the world. Obviously, uh, if uh, the board decides that you are more valuable at a station X rather than a station Y, then you have to go to the place where they have chosen uh, to send you. Got it. So, and yeah, and but, but whatever you are studying at Georgetown, will that be taken into consideration for your next posting in terms of skill yes. sets that you acquire and uh, the specializations that you are focusing on? So all those yeah, things. Will... It, yeah, obviously, obviously. So whatever I do at Georgetown, uh, I'll have to go pitch and I'll have to tell them that this is the specialization that I have attained. And if you think it is good enough, I should be given a posting that gels with what I have. Uh, studied or the skills that I've acquired in the last two years. But it is obviously up to them. They are very senior people. And in their minds, they will understand or they will analyze the my utility at a station A or station B. And that's how I'll be posted. Got it. Thanks. But that is obviously taking account. Got it. And uh, the other thing is the story of a diplomatic passport. What is that? I know as government officers, almost everyone gets the, we all get the, the white passport, but uh, diplomats have this very fancy red colored passport. What's, what is it all about? And uh, what are the perks, power privileges and who gets it? What is it all about? So uh, after uh, like a certain uh, seniority uh, in uh, the ME, you get uh, this diplomatic passport, which is the maroon passport. Before that, you get this official passport. And it is not exclusive uh, to the MEA, even uh, joint secretary level officers and above all across the government service uh, and uh, secretaries and ministers and other people, uh, eminent people whom uh, the government chooses to give. They all get this diplomatic pa uh, passports. And 
the privileges attached uh, with diplomatic passports are uh, so there are agreements between countries for example india has an agreement uh, with jamaica Uh, that uh, you could enter uh, that uh, jamaican diplomats would be allowed to uh, with diplomatic passports obviously will be allowed to enter india without a visa and vice versa for indian diplomats so there are some extra countries uh, where indian diplomats uh, can enter without a visa or they could get visa on arrival for example uh, on a diplomatic passport so this is one perk uh so it is basically a distinguishing feature so mm-hmm. if you are for example in a country and you have a diplomatic passport obviously the government of uh, officials there would understand that you are on a government mission or your government has uh, and that you need to be treated in a certain way and that's about it that's how, that's how it goes so it's it's more to do with the recognition that uh, you are a representative of the host country and that you are at a certain level of seniority rather than anything else okay makes makes a lot of sense and uh, so when i was in petroleum ministry i worked very closely with uh, bene pradhan he is currently i think the the ambassador in tanzania i was speaking to him a few days ago and uh, based on what all i could i could gauge from this interaction i realized that um, ifs officers are holding wonderful positions across the globe but they also do deputations so when i met bene pradhan uh, he was uh, in the ministry of petroleum and he was doing incredible mm-hmm. work there Uh, so how do deputations work for the ifs officers do they de- they can take deputations only in the central government or can they also depute in the state governments and and hold positions that a usual ifs officer in those states might 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 be holding okay so uh, dep- uh so we have uh, the me has certain uh, posts in different uh, central uh, like ministries in other like ministries of the central government uh, where uh, the mea sends uh foreign services uh FL, ifs officers for deputation it is uh, the petro- one of the ministries is the petroleum ministry as you said the other ministry uh, would be the ministry of commerce then we have we send officers to the ministry of defense the reason being that these, these uh, ministries have a lot of international exposure so uh, 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 like as a petroleum ministry the officials have to deal with foreign governments because uh petroleum or any other source of energy is not something that can be uh, entirely produced used decided by india what happens in the middle east what what's happening for example uh, between russia and ukraine drives up the prices drives up the availability of energy resources and therefore uh, it makes sense that a foreign service officer is sort uh, sort of there to give advice or to take charge of the interactions with foreign parties the same is with the ministry of defense and with the ministry of commerce so there are uh, like deputation postings for the foreign service officers similarly in the security the national Cons- uh, security council secretariat the present deputy uh, deputy nsa was is a foreign service officer uh, he was our ambassador in china uh, vikram misri sir and as far as uh, postings in the states are concerned uh, i don't know i don't think that would be called deputation but we have something called the regional passport passport offices in most of the states across india and do we do send uh, representatives from the mea to head these offices including foreign service officers so i know for a fact that uh, my senior uh, heads the rpo in mumbai rajesh gawande sir who is a very popular foreign service officer similarly in lucknow and as far as deputation into the administration of state is concerned i have heard, like i think it is possible but i don't have a like uh, an example to give you as of now but i think that is something that has happened before too so we are all in the government machinery and if the government of the day uh, in the state allows and if the me agrees i think that is something that is possible too. but i don't have an example for that all right now tell me more about the the attachments that that took place when you were in the training phase you know the naval attachment the attachment with the armed forces so on and so forth how exciting was it and um, how fruitful was it for you so uh yeah that that's uh, like a great learning curve and a uh, very uh, like uh, a time uh, where there's a lot of excitement because you get exposed to a lot of uh, new things as far as i am concerned uh, after we joined uh, the fsi the ssifs that is the sushma swaraj institute of foreign service in delhi in december we uh, were taken to as i told you colombo and we stayed for, there for a week we went around the country saw the development projects that the government of india is doing 
got to meet the high commissioner, got to meet the DCM, got briefings from different divisions about the work of the high commission there. So that was like our first, uh, the first thing or the first attachment that happened. After that, uh, we uh, there is something called a Bharat Darshan, which is not uh, exclusive to the foreign service that happens mm -hmm. in the IS and the IPS and all the services. However, ours was cut short because we had uh, like attachments to do uh, in Delhi too. So you could sort of make uh, the plans for the Bharat Darshan and we went to Ladakh yeah. and we went to Pang uh, Pangong So Lake and uh, we went uh, and spoke to uh, people from all shades and hues there and then we went to Andaman and Nicobar so that was very exciting to, to be with your colleagues to travel all across India and then we went to Tiruvannamalai. after that uh, as far as army so there are three attachments army uh, navy and air force but uh, unfortunately in our case we could just do the army attachment because as I said uh, we had attachments to uh, do in Delhi mm -hmm. so I went to Sikkim and uh, we interacted uh, with the army personnel there we got to know the situation at the border there and we got briefings and so that that was very enriching uh, too once we were back in delhi uh, we had this asean india uh, summit which, which commemorated 25 years of the relationship between india and asean mm -hmm. and so we were all attached and given different roles uh, in that summit and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so so i was attached for example with one asean country and i had to prepare briefs and also the, I was involved with the logistical part of it. So that was our first exposure into the workings of the Ministry of External Affairs. And I found that a very fruitful uh, seeing uh, the actual heads of states and actual heads of governments for the first time with our eyes. So that was something special. After that, uh, we also had the International Solar Alliance in which more than 40 heads of states and governments uh, descended in Delhi. They stayed there for two, three, four days. And then we had all these meetings at the Rashtrapati Bhavan. So I was attached uh, to a country called Togo, which was which is in uh, West Africa. Yeah. And again, to meet the head of uh, state of that country and the chief of protocol and the ministers and to understand how they view India and to enrich my knowledge about that country was also something that I cherish. So that was basically it. And then there are call call ons uh, the Honorable Rashtrapati Ji, the Honorable Prime Minister of India the Honorable Foreign Minister of India, the Foreign Secretary. So all that happened. But uh, uh, from the starting point in December 2017, when I went into the Institute and when I came out in uh, June, mm -hmm. I think I became a lot richer in terms of experiences, in terms of exposure, in terms of experience. So once you complete that journey, you realize how much you have gone through and how much you have gained as a Foreign Service Officer. So it was like our dreams to meet or to see uh, the... Honorable Rashtrapati ji, for example, or the Honorable Prime Minister in person or to meet meet different heads of state, to basically interact with them, to speak to them. And that is something, um, when that actually happens, you become a lot wiser, you become a lot experienced. So that, that really is something that I cherish. Well, I absolutely love how the, the UPSC preparation phase ties up with the training phase and eventually with the job. Where you begin with learning the history of India, the geography of India, and then you experience it, and then you represent it. So I love yeah. it. Love the way how it's it's wonderfully architectured. And hats off to the DOPT UPSC for designing the entire thing. And uh, one of the dreams of many newbies, at least, uh, who are preparing and are thinking of a career in foreign services, is that they get to work with the UN or World Bank. Uh, I am aware of the fact that uh, India has a permanent mission and the kind of work that they do in the UN is starkly different from the UN sort of a work. But uh, what's what's the kind of work that India does in the UN? And uh, and how can a diplomat become part of the UN? Is there an international deputation that they can participate in to be part of the World Bank or the UN? Okay, so I would not be the right person to answer this because obviously I have not done any postings at the permanent mission of India in New York. But with my limited knowledge, uh, I know that uh, there are different uh, sort of committees at the UN and we send uh, the officers who are posted at the UN are uh, given responsibilities of dealing with one of the committees uh, that are operating at the uh, United Nations. And uh, so you do a lot of uh, multilateral work there and you specialize, for example, for example, there is a committee on a certain um, uh, certain region of Africa, and you are, you have been working. You worked there for an year or maybe 
two years and you specialize in that region so i think it goes like that but it is certainly the postings at the un uh, uh, at our the indian uh, mission in you are certainly one of like the, the most prestigious ones and the top notch officers of the foreign service get those uh, postings as far as deputations to the un are concerned i know for a fact that uh, uh, nagraj naidu sir uh, was uh, the chief of staff of the unga president who happened to be uh, the foreign minister of maldives mm-hmm. for an year and i think is uh, if we can call that deputation it has just ended so he was basically working uh, with the unga president for a year as the as the chief de cabinet as they call it so i think is possible but how it happens or when it happens or who is sent up is something that i think uh, would be dealt it would be dealt at a much uh, senior level and i would not be the right person to answer that as far as world bank and imf are concerned i don't think uh, there is any indian foreign service officer working on deputation to these uh, agencies but there are certainly lots of uh, indians as well as indian uh, uh, origin people yeah the oci who work in uh, the world bank and the imf uh, geeta gopinathan who is yeah. the second in command uh, at the imf is a uh, an oci card holder is an indian origin person and so are lots of economists and uh, managers who work in the imf and the world bank i can say that because i am living in washington dc mm-hmm. the headquarters for both are here and i get to meet a lot of people who are there in both agencies and who are either uh, indian passport holders but mm-hmm. mostly oci card holders So now um uh, last few questions and this has been truly uh enriching i think it's it's the treasure trove of information that not many people have access to we spoke in at lens about so many facets of the life in the foreign services and uh, hopefully this might uh, reduce the the information deficit that sort of uh, that many people have so if let's say someone is confused between you know while filling a daft form you know they're confused should i prefer ifs or ias what are five six things they should keep in mind when they are opting for the ifs um and of course you will have biases and rightfully so uh why should someone choose ifs over the ias so that would be the perfect question for you then so uh like i won't nudge anybody to choose the foreign service over a service or b service because uh the first thing i would say uh, to an aspirant would be to just go uh, with uh, the passion of the person because you have to uh, spend the next 30 or 35 or 38 years of your life in a service so if you make a wrong choice and you are not satisfied uh, with that choice for the rest of your life i think it would come down very hard on you and you won't have a satisfactory uh, or a happy life so to be very careful and to fill your passion and never to choose uh, based on what a person a or your family or your friends are saying to think why you have uh, decided to take that examination in the first place and whether you were motivated uh, to go into the administrative service and make policies or policing or work in the revenue department or did you want to work uh, in the foreign service uh, to forward india's uh, foreign policy objectives so that is the call. that is a call that the person has to make based on his or her passion and while being very clear uh, that he or she would be responsible for his or her choice for the rest of the life so this would be something i would say as far as foreign uh, service is concerned i would say that uh, you would have a lot of exposure you would get to see the world that would be one of like the positives the second would be your family would uh, get a lot of opportunities abroad your children especially would get to study in good schools would get a lot of exposure a lot of career opportunities and options you would have um, as far as uh, like money is concerned monetary wise you would have a com- comfortable life uh, you wouldn't have to struggle in that regard obviously if you like uh, foreign policy work i i don't think there can be any other uh, service or a career option that could be more exciting but that is if you like uh, foreign uh, policy and international relations the negatives would be obviously that uh, you will have to uh, stay away from your extended family or uh, from your immediate family like your father and mother for extended periods of time and that could be a negative you will not get a chance to go 
into your district or your city or your village and work directly for the people there so these uh, if uh, so these would be uh, some things that you have to sacrifice uh, while in coming into the service but you have to be very clear as i said and choose uh, the service thinking that you will be uh, responsible for the consequences that come out of it makes sense and uh, very uh, valid advice and i think um, especially regarding the two points the first one is about the seeing the world i think as ifs officers you don't just see the world you experience the world while living in in top notch cities with the with the leaders who would be shaping the context of uh, of of the international affairs and second about the about the point that you mentioned mentioned about uh, being away from the family um my sense is that mea is very supportive um in ensuring that you get to meet your parents uh, could be wrong but uh, but is that a big challenge uh, or we live in a world where you can travel one from one part to the other in less than 24 hours or less than 1000 dollars so yeah. is that a big concern as of now so uh, obviously uh, the means of communication uh, have uh, bettered as the world has become more globalized and obviously there are more flights cheaper flights for going from place a to place b uh, if you are for example for example i am living in washington there is a direct flight from washington i think air india that takes you to delhi and there are other flight options through new york and through other cities so obviously in that sense a lot has improved even uh, our uh, mea gives us the option of going back once in a while and all of that that's all uh, that is all true but still uh, it is all relative in the sense that if you are for example posted uh, if i were an indian foreign service of uh, indian police service officer for example and i was posted somewhere in uttar pradesh i would maybe visit my parents six times a year as the post uh, living in washington dc where i would be able to meet them maybe once a year also giving the uh, also during covid for example i was posted in kingston and i could not go home for two years whereas if i had been in anywhere in india i would have met my parents and my family many times in the year and this period was particularly painful not to, like i speak for myself but i think this experience would be would have been shared by a lot of people in the foreign service mm-hmm. your parents get covid in india but you can do nothing you can not go back and you cannot help them and you cannot take care of uh, take care so all these things come up uh, all these uh, very difficult circumstances do come up when you are in the foreign service when you are li- living abroad but you have to deal with that those are the sacrifices that you have to make and when you sign up for the service you have to basically keep all these things in mind hmm. so so circumstances right. do uh, like do become uh, very difficult once in a while I hope they're safe and in good health now, yeah. your parents. And uh, I'm just curious, you know, uh, what for? What was your parents' reaction when you chose IFS over the IAS or the IPS? They would have hated okay. you, right? <laughs> no, uh, surprisingly, they did not because uh, before uh, I filled uh, the DAF form mm-hmm. for the uh, like two or three years before that, they had a very clear picture that I would, uh, if I would be filling uh, the UPSC form, I would be filling it for the Foreign Service. also the fact that my grandfather uh, was my uh, like most important advisor at that point in time mm-hmm. and he had lived through an era he was a government officer uh, in uh, the provincial services in uttar pradesh and he had lived through an era when foreign service officers were eulogized and as like larger than life and uh, uh, forwarding india's interests abroad as opposed to officers in other fields so there were some names which were like uh very popular as far as foreign service is concerned and so he had a perception that the best service in the world mm-hmm. forget about india is the indian foreign service and so he sort of nudged me initially saying that if you are thinking about foreign service and if you are in, uh, if you like to study about international relations and foreign policy there is no stopping you you should go for indian foreign service and that sort of eased me a lot and the Uh, removed a lot of social pressure from around me so my my family my parents had a fair idea before i filled the form that i would be going in for the foreign service and that i am not there not in there for the administrative or the police or the revenue service oh, so that kind I, of and i concur with your with your grandfather i think uh, ifs is a lifestyle and uh, i'm so glad even though you're sacrificing a lot uh, but all mm-hmm. all thanks to your sacrifices that you that that india is performing incredibly well across across various disciplines uh, in the in the entire world and our current foreign minister has definitely made 
it cool to be in foreign services so yeah, yeah. thank you so much for your time prateek it was a pleasure to interact with you and thank you so much for clearing all the doubts that many ifs aspirants will have and i hope uh, this this video series on money heist uh, nudges you to take decisions not just by by factoring and optimizing for money or privilege or 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 power but also about the lifestyle and the experiences and the relationships that you will build while being part of uh, any career or any profession that you might choose um so good luck thank you so much pratik and uh, any last words for the audience look uh, i would first like to thank you naman for uh, inviting me uh, on this forum and letting me uh, speak to your uh, audience and i really enjoyed uh, the program it sort of took me back down, uh, to uh, down the memory lane and i sort of relived those last 5 years since i have joined the indian foreign service and to anybody uh, any aspirant who wants uh, to join the foreign service i would say it is certainly one of the best services uh, in the world if uh, not uh, not just in india but uh, in the world and you will enjoy your time and come with a commitment uh, to serve uh, the country you would all obviously have to make some sacrifices but the, in the end i think you will be satisfied and you will realize that it is worth it beautiful good luck pratik and look forward to meeting you and uh, possibly meeting you in person so good luck take care and stay safe thank you namaste stay safe